Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. The terrible storm swallowed Dubai, the city with the most gold in the world. Nevertheless, it all disappeared just after one night. This city sank into the very watery, is this just a natural disaster, or is it a warning from God? In this episode, I will discuss these issues in more detail. Smash the thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. Dubai City, used to an arid climate and scorching sun, is suddenly at the mercy of an unprecedented occurrence. The sky, which was once consistently clear and calm, has darkened with the ominous hue of storm clouds, bringing a force rarely seen here. First, let's look at the climate in Dubai. Dubai's desert climate means it's a sure bet for sun weather all year round. The lowest average temperatures are around 20 degrees Celsius in January, while the summer months between June and August have averages of around 30 degrees Celsius. Dubai gets an average of 8 to 10 hours of sunshine a day year round. And especially Dubai typically gets very little rain, usually with just a couple of days of rain during the winter months. Yet, there is a storm. A tense atmosphere pervades as everyone, locals and tourists alike, looks up, witnessing a city that once defied nature now bracing for an unpredictable and uncontrollable force. This is not the ordinary storm. The natural disaster strikes suddenly and unexpectedly, contrasting sharply with Dubai's stable and predictable daily life. As the first raindrops fall on the sun-scorched ground, there is a sense of surprise. Could a city that has mastered natural elements, from building artificial islands to air conditioning its outdoor spaces, be so disrupted by nature's force? Within a few hours, the Dubai sky unleashes the full force of nature's power. The wind's whisper was gentle at first, but it became more intense over time. Soon, these breezes became the howling of a storm, foreshadowing something extraordinary. The sky, once a brilliant blue, had changed to a terrifying gray, and the air became heavy with anticipation. Dubai, a city proud of its environmental control, has seen its skies devolve into chaos. Then the rain started. Not in light drizzles, but in heavy downpours. The city's roofs and streets were pounded by heavy raindrops that never stopped. The desert, which was used to aridity, was suddenly submerged in floodwaters, as if plucked from a fairy tale. Streets that had been bustling just minutes before lay eerily quiet, as people sought refuge from nature's sudden onslaught. As night fell, the storm created a dramatic atmosphere, with lightning streaking across the sky, illuminating the darkness while also making it enchantingly surreal. The connection between the Burj Khalifa and the lightning strikes was not only a natural phenomenon but also had profound symbolic significance. It reflected the risks and challenges that come with pushing humanity beyond nature's limits. As the storm continued its relentless assault on Dubai, the city underwent dramatic changes. Streets that had once been busy with traffic became impassable streams, and carefully designed roundabouts and tunnels were submerged underwater, becoming dangerous obstacles. The drainage system, which was designed to handle normal weather conditions, was overwhelmed by the unexpectedly heavy rainfall. This led to a domino effect, flooding many streets and even the lower floors of some buildings. The city, once praised for its forward-thinking vision, now faced a scenario that appeared to belong only in post-apocalyptic films. Is this natural disaster simply a rare meteorological event, or does it have a deeper, even sacred significance? Natural disasters have frequently been viewed in a larger context throughout human history, with some seeing them as messages or warnings from supernatural entities. This is a common belief in many religious traditions, where natural events are thought to reflect the will of gods or the consequences of human actions. So can a natural disaster like the massive storm in Dubai serve as a powerful reminder for humanity to reconsider our relationship with nature's power? According to my opinion, this is most likely the wrath of God. Behold, the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest, it will burst upon the head of the wicked. There are symbolic storms raging in our lives, such as the storm in Dubai. 
The worst of these is the storm of God's anger against our sins. Jeremiah tells how the false prophets reassured the people, nothing will happen to you, everything will be okay. They do not take seriously God's response to human sin, but it was a life-threatening mistake. God has every right to expect us to obey Him. After all, He created us. If we disobey Him and do all kinds of bad things, we will be punished. This may have happened during our earthly lives, but it will certainly happen after we die, when we must appear before God's heavenly judgment seat. Then, if we show wickedness, God's wrath will pour down on us like a hurricane. That would be terrible. Storms were also sent as punishment when God's message is repeatedly rejected. After it has been explained and given many opportunities for people to change, God's punishment will come. These punishing storms are not random acts of nature, because every form of wind and storm is determined by the Creator. History reminds us of these punishing storms, the flood of Noah, the wind of A.D., and the thunder of Tud. God calls them a punishment. So we sent upon them a screaming wind during days of misfortune, to make them taste the punishment of disgrace in the worldly life. And as for the mud, we guided them, but they preferred blindness over guidance, so the thunderbolt of humiliating punishment seized them for what they used to earn. Quran 41, 16-17, the punishments can be categorized into two categories. Pharaoh and his people received both of them. Partial punishment doesn't put an end to a community, its purpose is to encourage those who have rejected God's message to return to it, allowing them more opportunities for change. When Pharaoh and his followers rejected Moses and his message, God sent a partial punishment to them. And we showed them not a sign except that it was greater than its sister, and we seized them with punishment that perhaps they might return to faith. Quran 43, 48, the punishment that God sent is described in detail in another verse. So he sent upon them the flood, locusts, lice, frogs, and blood as distinct signs, but they were arrogant and were a criminal people. Quran 7, 133, when Pharaoh and his people witnessed the punishment, they promised to become amongst the guided. And they said, O magician, invoke for us your Lord by what he has promised you. Indeed, we will be guided. However, when the punishment was lifted, they recanted. But when we removed from them the punishment, at once they broke their word. Not taking heed from partial punishments leads to the next kind of punishment, final punishment. When clear signs and guidance are knowingly rejected, when partial punishments are ignored and forgotten, the community enters into a very dangerous situation. They make themselves prime candidates for the final punishment, which leaves them no opportunity for change. It would be their capital punishment. After many neglected opportunities for change, God sent Pharaoh the final punishment. So he intended to drive them from the land, but we drowned him and those with him altogether. What is the purpose of this final punishment? Life has been created as a test to determine who would be the best in deeds. When a community is determined to always reject God's love, mercy, and message after multiple warnings and opportunities have been given to them, there is no point for the test to continue. Even if they were granted an opportunity to return to the earth and be retested, they would still not change. If you could but see when they are made to stand before the fire and will say, Oh, would that we could be returned and not deny the signs of our Lord and be among the believers. And even if they were returned, they would return to that which they were forbidden. And indeed, they are liars. It is for this reason that every person that enters the hellfire enters it justly, and they themselves confess to it. If you could but see when they will be made to stand before their Lord, he will say, Is this not the truth? They will say, Yes, by our Lord. He will say, So taste the punishment because you used to disbelieve. A punishment can be a test, but not every test is a punishment. A righteous person can be placed under a test so they can reap rewards or so their status in the hereafter can be raised, or so their sins can be removed. As a result, prophets receive the most severe tests so their rewards can be the most in the hereafter. Musab ibn S reported his father asked, O Messenger of Allah, 
which people are tested most severely. The prophet said, they are the prophets, then the next best, then the next best. Winds and storms are powerful forms of creation that can either be a form of mercy or punishment. Climatic conditions should remind us of our purpose and our relationship with our Creator. Wrath, the word alone instills fear and creates an image of someone on a warpath exacting revenge on all their enemies. There are no warm fuzzies here, no hallmark moments. If the wrath of a human can be scary, then what is the wrath of God going to do to a person? When you think of the fact that the Bible says, God is love, then how does the wrath of God coincide with that? That one question alone forces us to investigate and make sure that there is real understanding of what the wrath of God truly is. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines wrath as strong vengeful anger or indignation. Retributory punishment for an offense or a crime, divine chastisement. If you go by this definition alone, then you see that while wrath can have a tone of vengeance or revenge, it can also be justified depending on the circumstance. For instance, a person could commit a heinous crime and face the wrath of the court. This would be completely justifiable because the punishment or wrath fits the crime. If we apply this idea to God's wrath, then it's possible to say that God's wrath is displayed never to get back at someone, but rather to represent his justice. In other words, he is pouring out wrath as a form of justice, not to exact revenge. What does the Bible say about God's wrath? I want to share with you three scriptures that can give us clues into truly understanding God's wrath. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Romans 1 verse 18, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Romans 2 verse 5, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. John 3 verse 36, In all three of these verses, we see mention of the wrath of God. What I want you to pay attention to is what the wrath of God is in response to. You will see God is responding to godlessness, wickedness, stubbornness, unrepentant hearts, and rejecting Jesus as Savior. A simpler way of putting it is God's wrath is in response to man's sin. A logical question to follow would be, is this justified? The short answer is yes. God stands as the judge of all mankind. Each of us will have to give an account for what we have done and how we have lived. God gives us the freedom to make the choice in how we will live. What remains is that whatever decision we make, we must be aware of the consequences of those choices. What many people often struggle with is marrying the idea that God can be love and at the same time, God can exact wrath. After all, can these two coexist together? From the very beginning, God established a principle. He told Adam, the day you eat from that tree you will surely die. When God judges sin or responds in wrath to sin, he is doing so to uphold the principles or laws he has established. Without them, instead of any semblance of order, we would have chaos. The beauty of God's principles are they don't just apply to judgment. Because of his principles, God honors his promises. His principles are why he responds when we put our trust in Jesus for salvation. His principles are why we experience grace, mercy, faith, favor, and answers to prayer. Yet, it is also the same reason a person can potentially experience his wrath. He is just, loving, and fair. From the exact same throne flows the love of God and the justice of God. We get to decide which one we will experience. Isn't anger a sin? The best way to look at this is to consider Jesus' response to the money changers in the temple. Jesus entered the temple court and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Matthew 21 verses 12 to 13, When Jesus saw the abuses that were happening in the temple, he got angry. The people were being taken advantage of, 
and the money changers had turned the house of God into a place of business, greed, and profit with the sole motivation of the day. His anger was justified and warranted a response. The reason he wasn't sinning is that he was responding to the desecration of the house of God and the mistreatment of the people. These are proper triggers to anger and are often referred to as righteous anger. Anger that results because people are mistreated, anger that happens because the most vulnerable are harmed, anger that arises when those who are defenseless or weak get run over or stepped on by those more powerful, are all examples of righteous anger. However, as right as you are to be angry, it does not give you a license to sin. Being angry because of a justifiable reason is okay, sinning because of that anger is not. I encourage you to heed the words of the Apostle Paul, in your anger do not sin. Ephesians 4 verse 26, Now that we have painted a better picture and hopefully brought better understanding to what is the wrath of God, there is still something hanging in the balance. How does God's wrath impact you? Earlier, I mentioned that God established a principle that sin will result in death. Another way of thinking about it is because of sin, God will have to judge that sin, which is his wrath. The question remains, what do we do with this question of judgment? Even in the pouring out of judgment, God has given us a choice. Let me explain. Because all sin demands justice and all sin will be judged, God sent Jesus to take all the wrath and judgment of sin on him. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not only did God pour out his wrath, but it was his will and his plan all along. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Romans 3 verses 25 to 26 NLT, here is the choice that remains, you can accept Christ as your substitution, and in him find the complete judgment of your sin paid in full, or you can choose to pay the price yourself. One way or the other, the justice and judgment of God for sin will be fulfilled. God's love and mercy allow you to not have to pay the penalties for your sin because Christ has paid it for you. Here again, we see God's justice and wrath, but we also see completely God's love in action. You don't have to worry about God's wrath as long as one condition is met, you have put your total faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. His death gives you complete confidence that the requirements of God's wrath have been met. As believers, that doesn't mean God won't use discipline to correct us, it means that we never have to worry about paying the ultimate penalty for our sin. I know many people may still have a challenging time reconciling God's love and God's wrath. If you should ever struggle or are ever questioning what is the wrath of God, remember Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In remembering this, you will see the wrath of God and the love of God all wrapped up in the same act. You don't have to worry about experiencing his wrath because if your faith is in Christ, he has taken it for you. You are a product of his grace. Yes, God may discipline you if it is required, but you will never know his wrath. I do not think that God, in his anger, sends devastating hurricanes throughout the earth. The difference between God's divine anger and our human anger is that God does not lose his temper like we do. He is patient and long-suffering. Where I do believe America is encountering the judgment of God is in the fact that God may be withholding his divine protection. This is my attempt to carefully explain the wrath of God as I understand it biblically and how it applies in our day. 
The active and passive wrath of God Bible commentators have done a great job helping us understand the wrath of God. They define God's wrath in two categories that I find very helpful in trying to understand God's judgments. The passive wrath of God means He is withholding His presence, His protection, or His intervention. When I think of God's passive wrath, I think of how many souls have discarded the precious conviction of the Holy Spirit. For many, God never convicted them of their sin again, thus leaving them without hope and without Christ in this world or the world to come. This is God's passive wrath. So what is the difference between the Old Testament active wrath of God and God's passive wrath in our day? The difference is Calvary. There is a beautiful, bold word the Apostle John uses in 1 John 2 verse 2 to describe Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It is a big doctrine word called propitiation. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video.